Hi, Anne. Hi, Anne, how are you? I think you're on mute. You're on mute. Yes, I'm off mute now. Yeah. <laughs> how are you this morning? Good, good. How are you? How's uh, DC? It's nice and uh, warm in New York. Uh, yeah, it's well, we, it, we have sort of perfect weather. It, uh, there for a while, it got real hot. And there was like, oh, God, here we go, summertime. But then it backed off, and now it's it's sort of perfect. It's like about 68 degrees, sunny. Yeah, just nice. Yeah, um, listen, I appreciate you doing this, and uh, you're going to have another one for Aristotle. But I was kind of just want to ask you off topic. Are you interested in doing something maybe like off, uh, off, the, off the cuff, like Etruscans? Would that something be interesting to you? Uh, it would be interesting. I don't know anything about them. So, you know, it would be, to it would be off the cuff. I'd have to go find out something about them. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, uh, put it in your back pocket and, you know, let me think about it. Sure. Sure, because yeah. uh, I have a presenter that dropped out, and we're starting Roman. We can't start Rome without our Traskins. And it's gonna be, uh, <laughs> May third, so it's like uh, yeah, May third would be a little close for me. I, I need about three weeks at least. I think uh, you know what with work things I have to do and stuff like that. So um, uh, I'm sure somebody will step up. You've got quite a quite a group there. Um, yeah, who, yeah, yeah, yeah. And because uh, tomorrow, like I'm doing one off the cuff, like I have not, no knowledge of African culture. I'm doing on ancient Nubia and particularly two cultures, so cities, what have you, Meroyo and Nabata, which is, you know, the, uh, this, uh, this cultures of the uh, old intermediate, you know, ancient, uh, you know, Egyptian kingdom I mean, commemorating with. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Like I have, I have no knowledge of it and I'm just stepping into it. <laughs> and also like, I didn't know anything about the guns. I just did that gun power on Thursday and I'm doing Alcibiades. I have no idea. <laughs> I read the whole Wow, thing. wow, that's awesome. World, but people are dropping out. Alex was supposed to do Alcibiades, um, you know, uh, and um, what's his name? Uh, Hadrian's supposed to do the, um, you know, uh, Truscans and he's, you know, Last time you really put me down. I mean, we had, we're supposed to have three presenters, and he just decided them not to show up, and I, I can't. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think too, uh, we're at the tail end of the COVID stuff, so people are back outside again, and the weather's nice, and so I think, you know, that whole moment where we were all living in Zoom because we kind of didn't have any options for the past year is passing. And so, you know, um, we'll all adjust accordingly and life will go on for sure. Yeah, I mean, what the thing is, we still can't meet because, you know, if, uh, first of all, I have a lot of people like you're in DC, this people yeah. in Canada, you know, Ava is in Canada and other people. So we still can't meet. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, I'll let you share if you want to share. The yeah, good idea. Yeah, good idea. And again, uh, today is going to be uh, kind of like a small group. And, uh, you know, I, you know. I, I, I think that's fine. Um, uh, I actually like a small group. And since you're recording it and posting it, if anybody who's not here wants to take a look at it, they can look at it at their leisure. So it's kind of the best of all worlds. I'm particularly, I'm particularly happy that James is here because he's British. And so when I pronounce some of these British things wrong, he can correct me. Yes, I will try. <laughs> it, it, I, I, I have to say that I'm, I'm a bit of a faux British because I was born here. So ah, actually, oh, that's right. You said that, yeah. My parents moved to, when we were 10, when I was 10, to England uh, for my dad's job. But Where did you live in the States? I was born in Summit, New Jersey, Morristown, New Jersey. Now, in 10 years, you didn't pick up a Jersey accent. <laughs> no, I am. Uh, yeah. Uh, both, both my parents were non-native English speakers, the Sinclair's a name change. So I, that's why I didn't, I, that's, I, I think that's why I ended up picking up the English accent so readily. Really, yeah. yeah when we moved to England. But ethnically, I, I know I'm, I, if you don't mind, I, I'm asking, you can stop me at any point, but you're Jewish, right? Just like me. 
right? Uh, well, not technically, because it's only my father who is Jewish. Oh, okay. If you so you go by that way. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, my parents met, but I'd rather, fortunately, in the war, uh, after the war, because it, my father was a survivor, and my mother uh, had Holocaust lost her family in the, the bombing. You, your dad was a Holocaust survivor? Yeah. Wow. wow. Well, I'll, sure. I'll be right back, right back. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm sure you got some stories, uh, James. Uh, that, Sorry? Uh, I'm sure, you know, you got some stories, you know, you heard from your dad. I'd love to hear. I have two uncles that I lost. And, and, and no, understand me. I know I'm too young, but I, uh, my grandfather actually was born in uh, uh, 1879. Uh, uh -huh. So my, it happens to be that my father was the last son of the 12th son and i am the sixth son of my father so my father was 50 when i was born and his father was 50 when he was born so my grandfather was you know right now would have been what like close to 150 years old <laughs> wow yeah <laughs> yeah i think and he had lived. <laughs> that yeah. forever yeah it, it was we were talking about israel and um you know uh, uh british protectorate of israel so there was um, an Uzbekistani Jews quarter called Buharian quarter in Jerusalem. And my father was the first, my grandfather was the first one to buy a, a house when it was still under Ottomans and just transferred to, um, uh, just transferred to British protectorate. Uh, wow. that, that's how old. <laughs> so you bought the first house in Jerusalem um, under the, uh, you know, uh, and then they, when he went back to um, former, you know, well, at the time, it was the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union came to Uzbekistan in 1923, even though the revolution happened in 1917. They closed the borders, and they didn't let my grandfather out, but he had two houses in his, his Israel. <laughs> that, uh, and then my, my father, even though he had plans and the rights to it, didn't, couldn't claim it because Israel didn't declare the independence until 1948. Therefore, they didn't recognize any British protectorate um, uh, of properties in there. So. I wonder you know, if I can share... share my screen. I've got a picture of my grand, my father's family uh, pre-war. And uh, I, I, no, you, I don't know how to show you my screen. Uh, you go down the bottom and there should be a little green square that says share screen. Do you see that? Yeah. Uh, see it. Hi Greg. Um, Hi. Hi Greg. Hi. Did they interrupt something? <laughs> no, we're waiting. James is trying to share with us a picture of his family. But I, 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 I can't. Uh, I don't know how to. To, you can look at my screen normally. Um, yeah, I don't know how to do this. Well, how about this? Can you put, can you put on your camera and then just hold the picture up to the camera? Well, yeah, you got to show your camera. Don't worry, we're not going to see you naked. No, no, no. All right, I'm trying to get find. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to find the link where 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 you guys are on. Um, but your camera is not on. No, I, I realize. I'm trying to find. The, the right tab to going uh, to turn the camera on it's usually in the, the bottom left well, I, I don't think I, I know what they're doing um, I'll find it in a minute <laughs> we'll hopefully find it in a minute well, Zach and I were just saying, we have a very small group today, but I, I like a small group. And uh, since we'll have the recording, it'll be online. So anybody that uh, is out frolicking in the lovely weather, uh, post-COVID, hopefully, um, uh, they can just uh, check out the video, as, as Zach would say. Yeah, I, I don't even know how many people, 21 people signed up tomorrow for Naroya Napata. Oh, good, yeah, good. But, 
I don't know. Are you coming tomorrow? And uh... uh, I don't know. Again, I it, it you know it kind of sometimes on Sundays things have a way of coming up. You know. Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, by the way, Zach, I, I just want to remind you, I, I'm, I'm going to come, but only for one hour. I have to leave that. You remember I told you about that? Yeah, yeah, no problem. All right. You know, I know you, you have to teach karate, I forget, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've shared my, I, I've got my share screen. Well, uh, it, you know, it's the share screen is uh, on the bottom. If you hover over the bottom of the Zoom, it, it says share screen. Next to chat, the green button. Green button. Just to add mystery to, to, to the problem, I'm colorblind, but don't worry about it. It's, but it's uh, right in the middle. Share screen of, with the upper. There are five buttons there, and it's right in the middle. Uh, yeah, I think I've typed. Yeah. Share and without. Edit in a minute. And by the way, when we get to the presentation, I did add in some ancient history stuff, just so it's oh, <laughs> somewhat, yeah. somewhat on your theme. Yeah. I, I, oh, I have you have you sailed yourself, then? Yes, I have. I have. You know, living here by the Chesapeake Bay, here in Washington, um, everyone goes down to Annapolis uh, or somewhere on the bay on weekends a lot. And so uh, most everybody either has a boat or knows somebody, knows somebody who has a boat. And the Chesapeake is very easy to sail on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not challenging like up there in Long Island or further north up around Maine. You basically just, it's a big warm bathtub of water. <laughs> and you just sort of push the boat out there and then everybody kind of has a good time eating and drinking for a couple hours and then, right. You know, you paddle on back and go home. Do you have a boat of uh, of your own? No, or? no, 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 no. No, I, I uh, have a I have a friend uh, with a sailboat. Uh, I mean, not very big, uh, thirty seven yeah. feet. Well, uh, that's a good size boat. Yeah, yeah, and uh, he he keeps it on you know Long Island Sound is also oh, yeah. fairly Sound. safe. Do you know it is. It is. The sound is absolutely beautiful to sail in. You know who is friend? Who is his friend with? Is his friends with, uh, you know, uh, Abramovich? That's his friend. Who? One. No, oh, come on. No, you're, you're making. <laughs> he's making it up. Roman, well, Roman they probably Roman. don't know who that is, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, like, uh, not even close. Abramovich is a is a, a Russian uh, billionaire. Oh, like, uh, oh, oh, yes. Uh, Abramovich. Uh, yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, no, uh, uh, one the uh, Chelsea club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he talks. Yeah. He, he anchors in different he, he, places. He, he was he was joking, of course. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> my, my, my friend. Yeah, my friend. Uh, actually, he he's 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 not uh, Russian. He's a uh, he's American, but we've sailed together in many places because he, he used to participate in the competitions. I mean, I. I've, oh, cool. Uh, you well, know. then you you probably know as much about this uh, I, as I, I know. I, I, I've sailed a few times, but never in a competitive way. Uh, I no, know a bit, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have with to... him, we just sail for pleasure. We, we, you know, the best sailing waters in the British Virgin Islands. I don't know if you've ever been there. Yeah. We've been there I have, no, not the British. I've been down around uh, 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 Jamaica and a little bit Bermuda. Uh, and uh, down around the Caribbean, but yeah, the Caribbean sailing is unbelievable. Simply, be if nothing else, the water is so amazingly beautiful. It is like a jewel, a blue jewel. You look down in that water, you can see right down to the bottom, uh, and these gorgeous fish, I mean, it's lovely, but it's a little more challenging for sure, and some of those fish are dangerous. <laughs> yes, they are. I have, I, I have to confess that in the summer, which will begin for me in about three weeks, um, I, I sail most weekends. And, well, then, and, yeah. And, and I'm now I'm not working. I'm I'm decided I'm going to. Oh, really? So I'm you have doing, a boat? Well, I used the boat boats from the uh, Manhattan Yacht Club. Wow. Uh, well, then you you're going to be Manhattan New York Club. Where is it? Is it downtown here? It's actually now in New Jersey, across the river. Ah. 
and it's um, they're J24, so it's very participatory. Uh, yeah. I've, I've not been a, I'm not a big boat person, but um, yeah, I've been sailing from the time I moved when I was in my early 20s, oh. in Hong Kong. So um, that's my thing in the summer. Well, then, I, you know, um, I am going to be a complete novice as compared to you all. And so as I, I kind of do a little bit of sailing fundamentals, but we'll, we'll be able to go through that very quickly because you all, you all know more probably than I do. Yeah. Should we get started, Zach? Sure, go ahead. Okay. All right. Here we go. Let me screen share. And does everybody see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okie dokie. Let me just do full screen mode. All right. Well, as billed, this is going to be about the, the America's Cup, which I subtitle is about bickering, beautiful boats, and wonderful sailing. Uh, sometimes in that order, too. <laughs> of importance uh i'm gonna this is gonna i'm gonna go over this in about four four story segments um first i'm going to do a little bit of a background about sailing and sailboats and and you all uh having experience extensive it sounds like experience in sailing are gonna you, you correct me when i get this wrong then i'm going to tell the story of the uh, the beginning of the America's Cup in 1851. What who the people were involved in that story and how that story evolved and resulted in the American Cups. Then in the third seg the segment, I'm basically going to fast forward a little and go over the next 170 years of the uh, uh, America's Cup. Uh, in, in a, a very sort of superficial way, but enough to give an idea of how, how the competition has evolved over that time. And then finally, the most modern thing about the American Cups now, which are those incredible high, hydrofoil uh, boats that we see um, when we see pictures of the recent America's Cup. So uh, just to give you a little, my background, I did go way, 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 way back in the day to the Annapolis School of Sailing. <laughs> <laughs> and the best part of it was after you took the course, which is a couple of weeks, couple of weekends, they gave you a little card that said you were a graduate, a, a certified graduate of the Annapolis School of Sailing. So that when you visited other places, it was somehow easier to rent a boat because it showed you, you know, sailboat, you had credentials to sail. I, I you know, I, it, it was very superficial, but there it was. Uh, I do live by the Chesapeake Bay. So we, we uh, in Washington here, DC, it's about a 30, 45 minute drive, depending on the traffic to get to Annapolis. And the Bay is just a beautiful spot to sail. It's very easy sailing. Um, the average depth, with the exception of the Baltimore Channel that runs down the middle of the Chesapeake Bay, the average um, depth of the, uh, the bay is about 12 feet. Um, we have very mild winds by and large, so it's, it's not heavy, heavy sailing, and uh, so that's part of our life. And also, once upon a time, my sister and brother-in-law very kindly gave me a book, uh, which was... Uh, dedicated to me or written something from I, I've lost you no the, the, I, and, I think the connection and 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 froze yeah sure. oh. yeah something with a connection yeah probably so well, let's wait she she may come back what's happened to Aaron didn't he just join I don't know. Is it is it me? Something I did? I don't know. <laughs> Let me. Wow. Let me text her. I guess. Hi. We lost you. Yeah. Well, she'll come back. Okay. Uh, what 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 about the Aaron? He, he, he just appeared and then disappeared. No. Sorry, I am back. My malware just does that periodically. Right. It clicks uh, me off. So never worry. I always, 
I, and hopefully that'll be the only one for the rest of the, pre the presentation. So at any rate. Um, it's funny, you left and, uh, and Aaron disappeared too. <laughs> Oh, okay. that, 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 that affects Aaron, maybe, maybe. Oh, he, he came back, he came back. Okay, so we've got sailing before the wind, sailing close to the wind, and a little bit about uh, keels and centerboards. Uh, the original form of sailing was sailing before the wind, which involves square sails and involves Sit, the wind blowing you from behind and, and moving whatever your particular little vessel is. And for a long time, that was the basic structure of the boat. You got a hull, which in this case are two sponges, which gives nice buoyancy, a mast and a cloth sail of some sort, uh, cotton, flax, whatever the local availability was of materials, got in front of the wind and let it blow you along the way. Now that type of sailing is easy. It has its risks. Uh, you know, um, a big blow from behind and if you're not properly weighted down can take you over topsy-turny. Uh, there's many of these kind of um, YouTube videos uh, out there. And uh, as long as nobody gets hurt, they're highly interesting. This is somebody who had the temerity to put uh, a, a spinnaker on in a, obviously what was heavy weather. And it looks like maybe they had a center, centerboard kind of uh, arrangement, but they obviously got caught um, a lot of times, as you all know, in races. Uh, some people go a little crazy and they will decide to uh, optimize what they see as optimizing out their speed by putting up that big spinnaker and you get a, the right blow from behind and you're going to go tipsy. But in any event, uh, that idea is of a, that simple boat, the mask, uh, the platform and the sail, the mask, the platform and the sail. It's amazing how that those little boats are very similar to what uh, 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 Homer described uh, Odysseus doing. Um, he uh, felled, when he built himself a little boat, uh, 20 trees he felled. Uh, he had a wide as the floor is a broad ship of burden. So his stability was by width, it sounds like, uh, as opposed to having any sort of uh, keel. He set his mast, he put a yard arm, a rudder, and meanwhile Calypso brought him a web of cloth to make him sails, and then off he went down to the fair salt sea. So most of these older boats that, that, that are depicted have come down to us through depictions, uh, seem to indicate a, a sailing before the wind tack, uh, navigational approach. Um, and this is someone who actually prepared a drawing of uh, what he saw as the Homeric ship. Again, the basic principle is that you're going to go before the wind. Um, that's evident in even further pottery. This is 530 BC. Um, again, you can see, see the approach. Even the Egyptian. That's why it took him 10 years to come back, right? Because he, he just couldn't yeah. go where he wanted. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's right. Among other things, that's right. These are, of course, uh, from the Egyptian, um, some of the Egyptian tombs. These would have been, uh, of course, ritual vessels uh, heading, heading off into uh, the next world. Let me just make this full screen mode. Uh, but it's interesting to see uh, sailing is a, a perduring human activity um, and people love to draw pictures of sailing boats uh, and include them in their, their culture. Here's a Phoenician boat, which also looks like it's still using the basic principle of put up a sail and let the wind blow you from behind. Uh, also the Vikings. Put up that great big sail and hope that the wind comes from behind. If it doesn't, take the sail down and get the rowers to start rowing. Uh, 
And of course, these these major. This is a, a, a modern painting of uh, some Venetian ves a Venetian vessel, but the basic uh, square rig, square sail, three masted square rig. As you can see, how the idea of sailing before the wind, that technology kind of technological approach played itself out uh, to as late as uh, you know the 1500s uh, A.D. Um, and uh, it got more and more and more elaborate. Uh, but basically, uh, it, it reached one of its pinnacles in the Spanish Arma Arma Armada, which was uh, notably uh, a, a, a series, a, a, a fleet of galleons, all of which operated on the principle of sailing before the wind, having the wind blow them. I like this, this modern, again, modern painting, but it goes to show just how scary they must have looked <laughs> if they all came at you. And of course they were formidable and ruled the seas until they encountered uh, the, uh, the British fleet. And the British fleet had started incorporating into their vessels the concept of sailing close to the wind. Now, this is not to say that no one discovered that idea of sailing into the wind rather than before the wind by manipulating your sails, designing the sails differently uh, before this time, 1588. Um, and they probably did, but nonetheless, the, the mainstream technology for somebody like the Spanish Armada was sail before the wind. But when they met a fleet that could sail into the wind, which had a, a lot of more uh, range of options and agility, then they went down. And what hurt them even worse was uh, when they went to escape north uh, from the uh, the losses they had incurred in the encounter with the British, a big storm came up. And so they lost a lot of their vessels because again, sailing before the wind, just as we saw in that prior picture, uh, can wreck your boat pretty quickly. Um, and so that the, the concept of how to sail, how to use the wind, um, has had a lot of a lot of consequences through history in terms of uh, naval engagements. There's a couple of examples I just wanted to uh, bring. Yeah, up. I apologize. The first example. No. Yeah, the first example obviously is when uh, the Troy War. They were waiting for the wind, and when the wind didn't can't, didn't come, uh, the daughter of the, um, the 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 king from the um, Aegina. Yeah, Aegina was sacrificed. For wind to work, but so they can attack the Troy. Uh, that's one. The second one, Menke uh, Han, in um, 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 when they conquered Korea, uh, Mongolia conquered Korea, decided to attack Japan, <laughs> and they were waiting for the wind. Wind came, and of course, you know, Mongols, which were much superior than Japanese samurais, samurais was like one-on-one -on -one combat. So they were waiting for Mongols to arrive and Mongols, the wind, you know, took them somewhere else and they got crashed as well. And, you know, and Japan declared, obviously there was only several scattered boats of Mongols came to Japan. Otherwise Japan would have been conquered by Mongols too. And they never yeah. did. <laughs> uh, no, I, it, it, it's interesting. Um, uh, one of the pictures that I didn't include was another Egyptian tomb um, inscription which showed the peop the Egyptian encounter with the famous peoples of the sea right. um, and you know it's a it's a very close combat uh, scene that's depicted on the water um, but you can see that close combat simply meant getting your boat into the combat taking the sails down and fighting hand to hand because you had no real maneuverability uh, of the boat itself um, uh, so, yeah, no, those are great examples. Um, the, you know, catching the wind, if you're, again, if you're sailing before the wind, uh, you haven't adopted that technology of sailing close to the wind, your options are, are considerably limited. Um, it was great when it worked, uh, but if that wind wasn't blowing from behind you, again, you had to get out the rowers, 
or uh, sit there and wait. Um, so basically, to summarize, sailing below before the wind, it's blowing from behind you, and people still do it. I mean, if that's the direction your race is going in, and the wind is behind you, then you're going to put up these big spinnakers and let them blow you from behind. Uh, I don't know what happened to my nice picture of sailing close to the wind, uh, but that's a picture of a, a modern sailboats, which can, with it, with the triangular sail, sail directly into the wind, uh, which adds speed and agility. Um, here's a here's a better picture of that uh, sailing close to the wind. It's, you know, when I went to the Annapolis School of Sailing, that's one of the first things they told us. You don't sail before the wind. You mostly will be sailing into the wind. And they explained what they described as the Bernoulli principle of why sails can go forward and sail into the wind. And, and this is a diagram which was the simplest diagram I could find to the Bernoulli effect. Um, but uh, you all probably have a better concept of, of that principle. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's an aerodynamic principle, which I gather airplane wings use as well. Uh, something about when the wind hits the tip of the sail, um, one side has lower pressure than the other, uh, and that, that creates a motive force, um, uh, which I conceive of as almost like a sucking situation, but I'm told that's not really what it is. Whatever it is, uh, it works and it makes for considerably more fun sailing than just having waiting for the wind to get behind you and uh, push you. Uh, another element of that is uh, sales went from being square sales to being triangular sales were a key part of um, taking advantage of, of that wind principle. Um, and this is, again, is just, you know, the classic thing, anybody that learns sailing uh, will be shown a, 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 a diagram similar to this, that you, you don't, you can never sail directly into the wind, you're basically, you're sailing, as we say, close to the wind, uh, and there are various degrees of how close you can get to the wind, uh, with according, and, and hopefully, uh, these are the maneuvers you have to do if you're on a competition uh, route. Um, you'll have to go through these various maneuvers to take advantage of whatever way the wind is blowing, uh, given the direction you're going in. Um, I also wanted to mention that the other aspect of sailing close to the wind, um, you all know when you sail close to the wind, you'll start to, the boat will start to heal as this ship is healing. Um, the only way to prevent the boat from going completely over is, oops, going the wrong way, is to have uh, off, offsetting weight uh, in, in the bottom of the boat. And this is, this is, of course, just an illustration of various kinds of keels on uh, sailboats. Um, the two I would... Uh, point out are the most prevalent are uh, the full keel and the centerboard. The full keel is obviously built into the bottom of the hull and it's usually uh, you know a heavy piece of, of iron in there basically uh, whereas the centerboard is usually is often in most of the boat, smaller boats I've sailed in is just a flat wooden board that you can pull up and down. So if, if you have if you're sailing perhaps before the wind um, and you don't need any counterbalance, then you can pull that up and with no, no uh, keel drag, that'll enhance your speed a little bit. But once you turn around and start sailing close into the wind, you need that, that counterbalancing pressure that's, that's shown in this diagram. So if you're doing, if you're doing racing, this is a game you're going to be playing is to minimize the weight of that counterbalance without sacrificing, uh, you know, turning the ship over, which would be the case in this, this uh, 
this vote if there weren't a keel counterbalancing um, the effect of, of the directional the direction they're sailing in. So that's basically the the fundamental principles I just wanted to note uh, as, as background for for getting into um, competition sailing, which is what the uh, the um, America's Cup competition is. Uh, a final note: the word yacht is actually a Dutch word, apparently, um, and came into use when Charles II decided instead of returning to England from France on a big battleship, elected to uh, take one of these smaller yacht ships. Uh, and uh, thereupon it was determined to be a sort of a royal prerogative and uh, a luxury a luxury kind of sailing because they're not big enough to be commercially viable. They're not really warships, <coughs> excuse me, but they are pleasurable for sailing. Um, and you can see that this particular, I don't know that this particular boat that I pulled a picture of here, I'm sure it's not the one Charles II was specifically on, but it's apparently like the one. And um, you can see the triangular sails. Um, in this case, it's a gaffed rig boat. It's not, the mainsail is not completely um, triangular. It's, it's a funny polygon shape with the gaff at the top for lowering it and raising it. And we can't see the keel, but it's down there to provide stability. Okay, which brings us to the America's Cup competition per se. Uh, and my next story is, is going to be the story of 1851 and how, how the America's Cup came into being. This is actually a nice photo. If you'll notice in the background there, that's the Golden Gate Bridge. This, this photo must have been taken uh, in uh, uh, the early 2000s when the America's Cup race was sailed in the San Francisco Bay, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, uh, basically in the beginning, it was a, a story of British gentlemen uh, versus American sportsmen. Um, and that flag on the right, uh, left rather, is the flag of the Royal Yacht Squadron and the flag on the left, right, okay, left is the Royal, Squ uh, Royal Squadron, the right is the New York's Yacht Club. Um, a little about the, the, the cup itself, it of course is not a cup, it's a ewer, which is a, another Greek form. It's just about a yard tall, uh, short of yard tall. It, it now stands a little higher because they've added to the base. Um, it was crafted in 1848 by a London silversmith, Gerard and Company, and apparently several were made. And uh, a British aristocrat by the name of Henry William Paget, the first Marquess of Angsley, uh, bought one uh, and donated it to his club. He was a member of the Royal Yacht Squadron uh, to be one of their, their trophies. Um, not anything particular at, at that particular, at that time. It was just another trophy to have in hand for one of their rate upcoming races. And they were, uh, membership in the Royal Yacht Squadron was by its original bylaws open only to gentlemen. <laughs> However, that is defined in British society. Um, a little more about the, the, yacht, the, the Royal Yacht Squadron. It, it itself was founded in 1850, uh, 1815. Um, as I said, the qualification was to be a gentleman who could, who was an owner of a vessel not less than 10 tons. Um, I don't know how much 10 tons is, but I've got a, a, a feeling uh, that was about the size of a standard, what we would consider a, a standard uh, sailboat. Um, 
there, uh, they took, they got heavily into rate comp competitive racing from the beginning. That, that was their focus. They set up their he headquarters down on the Isle of Wight. Is that, is that the right way to say it, James? Yes. <laughs> okay. It is the Isle of Wight, yeah, indeed. <laughs> indeed. Uh, which, as you can see, here's London, uh, uh, you know, a little bit to the northeast um, and a good run down there. And then this, uh, this, this small castle is the club headquarters. Uh, it also was donated by the Marcus Kess of uh, Ainsley. Um, they had sort of a link to the Royal Navy in the sense that uh, in doing their competitive sailing, part of the concept was that they were exploring in the course of those competitions, new uh, yacht designs, new sail designs for ever faster sailing with the wind, uh, new hull designs, new keel designs. Um, and they're actually apparently um, some branch of the Navy. They have some official Navy designation with it, without actually being the Navy. So if you are a, a member of the Royal Yacht Squadron, you you can wear a uniform, a, ensigns, a, a Navy ensign's uniform. Um, and then in the eight, 1840s, um, as other yacht clubs started to evolve all over England and probably I'm sure Europe, uh, they opened up their competition to non-Royal uh, yacht squadron boats. So this this spirit of competitiveness was was emerging there. Uh, this picture down here is actually a picture of uh, taken, I believe, during their their bison, their 200 year anniversary, which uh, was celebrated um, obviously in 2015. And uh, <clears throat> their admiral is the late uh, was the late Prince Philip, and there he is wearing the yacht squadron's ensign uniform. And he was apparently quite a, quite a fan of the quite a, an enthusiastic member of the yacht club. Always went to their Cows Week uh, competition. Um, so the Royal Yacht Club has always been a, a, a major focus of aristocratic interest in sailing. Um, a lot of the pictures of when the czar came to uh, on his yacht or uh, the Kaiser came on his yacht were to come to Cows Week here. Um, Cows being the city where the Royal Yacht Club is located on the Isle of Wight. Um, and then you know, over across the pond in America, we had the New York Yacht Club, which was not so much necessarily gentlemen, although I'm sure in the generic sense they were gentlemen or may have been, but they were more, they were flat out sportsmen. It was about competition and it was about wagering. Um, and it, we'll talk about this more, but this of course is a picture of the schooner America. Um, the New York Yacht Club was uh, founded by this rather dour looking fellow, uh, Commodore John Cox Stevens, but belying his rather dour appearance, uh, he and his two brothers were quite the, quite the uh, gamblers. In, gamblers is the wrong word, but uh, loving to lay wagers on competitions that they framed. And they apparently were no big time spenders. They came from a wealthy uh, shipping, American shipping family. Um, and uh, they were known for one time betting at that time, uh, an amount uh, included their gold watches and things of that nature on a horse race which apparently they, they've, uh, to their fortune, won. But that made them, they were well known as, uh, I'm sure, the Stevens boys <laughs> who, who loved to race and, and lay wagers on, the, uh, uh, on those races. They spent a lot of money on their, um, 
developing again kind of the technology of their their uh, their yachts um, and uh, Commodore Stevens' brother at his death left six hundred and fifty thousand dollars again a, a tiny sum in the mid eighteen hundreds to found uh, the Stevens Institute of Technology. Um, on their uh, family property in Hobo Hoboken, which is uh, where, for a lot of years, models of the America Cup um, vessels were tank tested. Uh, um, and uh, so they were, even though they called themselves the New York Yacht Club, at that time, they were, they were based in um, Hoboken, New Jersey. They did most of their sailing in the waters around, the Staten, around Staten Island which as you all as New Yorkers know is tricky sailing. Um, you get ocean winds, you get land winds. So if you can sail, sail, sail well around there, you can sail. Um, <clears throat> By the way, they, they, that, their, their original building is still up there in Hoboken. Oh, really? And I should have caught a picture of that. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's very near Hoboken North. Uh, uh, Ferry pier. Yeah. Also, the, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry. Sorry, James. Go ahead. On a previous, oh, on on. A, uh, previous slide, you were saying Czar Wilhelm II um, uh, and uh, let's say the uh, British monarchs all were having, you know, uh, kind of, you know, um, cooperation on this yacht, but they were all cousins. <laughs> they yeah. Were they were all related, so they're also family. Yeah, you know, no, exactly. King George, as we know, was a cousin of Nicholas, uh, Russian czar. Uh, King George was actually uh, half Greek, <laughs> ended up being a George of England. I mean, a uh, king of England. He is actually, he defended uh, Nicholas um, the Great, um, the Russian czar, uh, in when he was in Japan. And uh, one of the Japanese policemen attacked Nicholas and George, um, well, you know, while he was not a king, he was, you know, just his cousin, defending him with a, uh, with a stick. Otherwise, um, his whole head would have came off. We, they would never have had a Russian Nicholas Tsar. Maybe the revolution would have never happened. So King George actually probably <laughs> indirectly contributed to the revolution of <laughs> Russia because the, Nicholas was a completely uh, inept czar uh, to begin with. <laughs> but no, you're, you're, you're right, it's sort of like, you know, the butterfly wings that the butterfly, uh, you know, moves its wings and somehow that turns into a tornado over the course, through the course of nature. Uh, but yes, they were all family, uh, you know, events during Cow's Week, sailing week at, uh, at the Royal Yacht Squadron um, were family affairs of royalty. Uh, and so we have, we have the New York Yacht Club boys, uh, Commodore Cox and his two brothers, uh, and through apparently uh, some back channels, uh, there came to be this exchange of letters uh, between the Royal Yacht Squadron and the New York Yacht Club. And basically, on the left is the letter from the Royal Yacht Squadron, and it says, uh, "You know, we've we've heard through Sir Sir Bulwer that uh, you all there at the New York Yacht Club are building a schooner, which you think a schooner being a two-masted ship, uh, two-masted yacht." Uh, which you think is pretty hot. So we'd love to have you come over this summer. Um, these letters were exchanged in uh, March 18th, uh, January to March 1851. Come over this summer and visit us at the Yule Yacht, Rock, Yacht Squadron um, and show us, show us your, your, the, how well your, your, your vessel sails. Well, uh, Commodore Stevens answered back said, thanks a lot for the visit to the clubhouse. Uh, and a few friends and I do have a yacht uh, we're, we'd like to bring over and uh, avail yourself of the friend, friendly bidding. Now, this is an interesting little cross, 
cross current of understandings. It's pretty clear that uh, the Yacht Club folks were basically saying, come visit. I mean, the Royal Squadron folks were saying, come visit us. The way Stevens interpreted that, however, was come race us. <laughs> come race us for money. <laughs> Uh, and we will see how that plays out. There was also a reason that uh, the Royal Yacht Squadron would have been inclined to make this kind of formal, formal uh, invitation for, to occur in the summer of 1851. And that was because, uh, uh, excuse me, let me just go back for a second before I go to that. Uh, the schooner, this is the schooner that uh, Cox was referring to. Uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a very beautiful boat. They had actually uh, started building it in November. So they did not build it specifically for what turned into the America's Cup race. Uh, but what they were going to do um, uh, was what they were thinking, because they had numerous, numerous vessels. Uh, and as I said, they and he and his two brothers were always fiddling, tinkering with the overall hull design, uh, with the sail configuration, etc. Uh, and so this was this was a fortuitous opportunity that came up. Um, specifically, uh, some for you all that know statistics of vessels or appreciate statistics of vessels. Uh, America, the name of the boat, was fashioned on uh, what were known as New York Harbor pilot boats. And uh, that, that's a picture of one there, which had to be uh, extremely agile because of course they guided in the, the larger vessels into the uh, New York Harbor. Um, and apparently they also had to be fast because these uh, pilot boats competed among themselves uh, they uh, for business. So it was whoever was the first who could reach one of these large inbound vessels that needed a pilot boat uh, was the one that got the job to do it. And so they were kind of like taxi cabs back in the day in Manhattan, whoever could get to the passenger first. Uh, and so there, there was a lot of motivation to make these boats uh, seaworthy in general. Um, uh, the boat was, uh, the, the uh, entire length of the boat overall was uh, 101 feet. Of course, that would have included the bowsprit. Um, and its, its keel length at the waterline was 89 feet. So it's, you know, um, Greg, when you were talking about your friend that has a 39-foot boat, I mean, that's a good size. That's well with, it's not an 89, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a good sized boat. It, the stability uh, for these pilot boats came from, uh, of course they, excuse me, as you see in this picture, they did have a keel. They didn't have a fin keel. They had a full length keel, as you can see in the picture down in the lower right. Um, oops, going the wrong way. Uh, and they also had a broad beam, which was 22 feet at its widest. So it narrowed at the front and narrowed at the back and had a broad beam in the middle, um, uh, which, which was a very efficient sailing design as it turned out. Also, their sails were cotton. Uh, as it turns out, the Brits at that time were still using flax for their sails. And apparently cotton hold, depending on the wheat, excuse me, uh, holes well, uh, better than flax. And when it gets wet, holds its shape better. Um, all of these, these little incremental advantages. Um, it was uh, designed by two brothers, James Steers and George Steers, who had um, experience in building these pilot boats. Uh, as I said, the, the keel was, was laid down in November 1850. So, uh, so it was already in the works by the time that those letters were exchanged in March 1851. Um, it was launched on May 3rd to uh, specifically to head out to meet, to meet this challenge. Um, they did have a couple of cannon on board, uh, and basically the whole material was wood. Um, 
So that's the ship that uh, Commodore Cox and, and his brothers uh, decided to bring over to England to respond to what they saw as the Royal Yacht Club's challenge, as opposed to the Royal Yacht Club seeing it as, as an invitation. <laughs> Um, and the, the reason this was kind of a focal time was because it was the time of the Grand International of 1851, uh, which occurred uh, during the period May to October 1851. Um, this is the Crystal Palace. Is the Crystal Palace still up, James, in London? No, no. no. there's a big television transmitter where it used to be. Wow. Well, uh, Queen Victoria and her, her much beloved spouse, um, uh, Prince Albert, uh, this was the, all the brainchild of Prince Albert, who viewed himself as a progressive royal monarch. Uh, and of course, he was German, and so he was a very thorough progressive royal monarch. And he pulled together uh, what was one of the first international exhibitions. It was basically the World's Fair, the first big World's Fair. Um, and this was why places like the Royal Yacht Club were reaching out to places like uh, the New York Yacht Club and saying, hey, bring over your technology and put it on exhibition. Uh, and countries from all over the world were doing this. And of course, it wasn't just uh, yachts, uh, it was all sorts of things, um, tech textiles, whatever scientific innovations you had, um, I don't know, uh, your cultural uh, wonderful things to see. Uh, and this is the inside. And that must have been a marvelous building, that big glass structure. Um, uh, just amazing. Uh, it was a huge success. Uh, they had up to, you know, around 40 to 45,000 visitors a day. Um, and over the course of it, uh, you know, um, uh, 6 million people went through there. Uh, that's over there, the upper right hand corner, that's Prince, Prince Albert and Queen Victoria, who at that time still looked kind of looked young, she had not going, gone into mourning uh, that was to consume the re remainder of her life after Prince Albert's uh, untimely death as a young man um, and some of the children with them. So this was a royal international event where uh, uh, Great Britain was declaring itself as the progressive empire. Um, and so, of course, the Americans, we, we were invited to have a, uh, a, a little spot in the exhibition hall. Uh, however, our, our offerings were not considered very impressive. Uh, and uh, the, the satirical magazine Punch actually made fun of them and said they have so, basically saying they have so few to offer they should probably just rent out some of the space they were allotted for people who need beds and places to stay as visitors to the great uh, exhibition. Uh, and as Punch wrote, this is kind of funny, by packing up the American articles a little closer, by displaying the Colts revolvers over the soap and piling up the Cincinnati pickles on top of the Virginia honey, we shall concentrate all the treasures of American art and manufacture into a very few square feet and beds may be made to accommodate several hundreds in the space planned for, uh, but not one quarter filled by the products of the United States industry. And I'm, that would be even more snide if, writ, if uh, pronounced in a, a nice snotty London accent. <laughs> <laughs> but they basically were dissing us. <laughs> so this was, uh, you know, we, we at that point had not made much of an impression on uh, the London scene uh, in the, the overall gestalt of this great international exhibition. Uh, and meanwhile, and yes, yes. Um, so how much of the, uh, the fact that, you know, we fought the independence war and when, you know, we no longer about part, you know, obviously they, they were probably holding it against us that we're still there um, somewhat satellite, so to speak. I mean, not really, but 
you know, we've had. Oh yeah, I'm sure. And, and actually there had also been the War of 1812 uh, right. where they had attempted to reassert, the Brits had attempted to reassert, reassert themselves unsuccessfully. Uh, it came so far as, as uh, burning down a, a part portion of, of Washington here. Um, uh, Dolly Madison had to pack everything up in the White House and, and take it take it to another location while they were marauding. So uh, I, I'm sure, you know, I think at this point, um, we were kind of the little, <laughs> little cousins, so to speak. Uh, we were part of, uh, you know, Anglo culture. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think there was a direct antipathy anymore. You know, uh, Victoria and Albert were, were a far stretch from the Georges, who had been, you know, the reigning monarchs of uh, our warring period. Um, but I think at this point, they had come to sign of accepting us as independent, but also viewing us as kind of these rustic rubes <laughs> that didn't have much in the way of, of culture or achievement. And, yeah, they, when just they like thought Greeks, about... Just like Greeks and uh, Egypt, Egyptians thought of Nubians, which I'll talk about tomorrow, or the Greeks thought of, um, you know, anybody outside of Greek world were barbarians because... And people completely misconstrued that, but you know they thought of them as rude and you know uh, yeah. vile, so to speak. <laughs> and, and not so much rude, but just rubes, you know, uh, country people. They like said all they, th you know, I'm sure England at this grand international exhibition, France and Germany and Italy and. Britain itself had these wonderful engineering marvels and beautiful cultural pictures. And, and here Punch is saying, well, what the Americans brought over were soap and Cincinnati pickles. Uh -huh. <laughs> Wait, that's your... important. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, there's the old saying, he who laughs last, last laughs best and oh, so we... tell you that look at what doggy coin is doing right dodge coin and yeah he who laughs la you know last laughs best because people that... didn't believe in it and it was a joke and now you know now it's all awesome. no. exactly exactly <laughs> so while 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 we're sort of um failing to impress in, in the crystal palace uh you know, Commodore Cox and his brothers and his sort of, you know, the, uh, the little business consortium that was funding the America yacht, yacht uh, had, had the yacht sailed over. It was sailed, uh, it was crewed by Mr. Brown who had built the boat and also George Steers and his brother, Jane, who had decided the boat. They brought the boat, sailed it across the Atlantic. It sailed successfully across the Atlantic. It took about uh, a month. Um, they went to Le Havre in France and there uh, had the yacht dry docked and sort of generally spiffed up, repainted um, any damage from the transatlantic crossing, um, repaired, etc. So that when they sailed into Cowles, uh, they were, the America was looking good. And however, uh, when they sailed into Cowles, Mr. Cox, Commodore Cox, basically started trying to set up a competition with anybody he could, could get him to buttonhole to listen to him. And he was making these, um, you know, these competitions were wagers for outrageous amounts of money at that time, 10,000 guineas, which I don't know, but I'm sure it's a lot. Uh, and the Brits were kind of looking at him like, we just invited you over for lunch, you know? <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, we're not interested, that's not what we do. Uh, you know, we're gentlemen, we just race for the, the honor of it um, and assisting the Royal Navy in development of, you know, new racing, of new sailing techniques, etc. cetera. So uh, Commodore Cox, uh, you know, it was getting, it had, I'm sure, Yankee impatience and he was getting a little frustrated till uh, the uh, Royal Yacht Squadron announced that it, as part of uh, 
of, of these overall, you know, international exhibition related ac activities, just like we have a lot of associated activities the city has when it ha hosts the World Fair, that they were going to sponsor one race and it was going to be a hundred pound race. Um, hundred pounds not being a lot of money to this crowd. So it was just a little friendly race, but the part that caught Commodore Cox's eye is that it was going to be open to yachts belonging to the clubs of all nations. So Commodore Cox was not able to get anybody to actually enter into a personal wager on the race like you would on the horse race, but nevertheless, here was an opportunity to race and compete and kind of spiff up America's image a little bit uh, since we, we, we've been a bit of a flop at the Crystal Palace. Uh, and so along came the day of the race, August 22nd, 1851. Now, this is, a, is kind of a fun little uh, tourist map. It was actually a postcard. There's the source reference over there of, of the Isle of Wight. Now, it's about 55 miles around the Isle of Wight. And this, uh, let me go back, this race uh, was, was uh, this Royal Yacht Squadron 100 Cup race whoop, 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 was going to be a race. Anybody could enter. You just had to be there at Cows, which is at the top of the picture, at the, at the Royal Yacht Squadron Harbor. Uh, and at the, when the starting gun went off to take off clockwise, to go all around the island in sort of a sort of a free for all, uh, of course, governed by what were considered the appropriate rules of sailing as to right of way when two boats started to cross each other, things of that nature. But there were no it was numerous boats. It wasn't just two boats. Uh, there were no uh, requirements with regard to the yachts, uh, you know, as to size shape, whatever. They, of course, were all under sail, uh, no motor power of any sort. Um, uh, you also see that uh, right there to the left, to the left is the Royal Yacht Squadron up there at the top. To the right is Osborne House. Osborne House was one of the favorite residences of uh, Queen Victoria and um, Prince Albert, and they were there. Uh, for this whole series. But the 100 cup race, this, to go back, this, this little 100 cup race was not on, on, the, on, the, on the menu of activities, was not considered a big deal. The big deal was Her Majesty's Cup. And I think that Her Majesty's Cup was only given, you could only race for that as a member of the uh, Royal Yacht Squadron. But as an ancillary activity, they had this little, um, this little hundred hundred cup watch. Cox entered, and off they went to engage in this uh, fifty five mile race, which usually, apparently, uh, at that time, with the sailing technology at that time, would have taken about uh, seven or eight hours uh, to go all the way around. Um, and this is a great YouTube that was put together. Uh, video that was put together for the Royal Yacht Squad on the occasion of their bicentenary on 2015. Uh, this gentleman is the uh, current Commodore of the Royal Yacht Club. His name is Christopher Sharples. And he, among, among other things in this YouTube video, gives a little rundown of how the race proceeded. Um, uh, basically, there were 15 boats at the start. He's pointing there to where, uh, you know, the Royal Yacht Squadron location would have been. Um, the yachts did not pull up at that time to a starting line. It was just the gun went off when the first, when the starting gun was fired, which was at 9.55, apparently, a.m., the boats were actually at their individual moorings. And they just, that was just the signal to start the race. And so they would 
all individually start pulling out to pursue this course. And in point of fact, at that point, America had a little problem with its, its anchorage at that time, and it got off late. It took off the last of the 15 boats. Uh, they sailed obviously eastward because they were going clockwise and the records show they had a flood tide and a light following breeze. So at this point, they were sailing before the wind, which is, is not optimal. But since this is a circular clockwise route, uh, what would be sailing before the wind at the beginning of the race would eventually turn in, presuming the wind, direction of the prevailing winds continued west to east, would turn into a situation of sailing into wind as you got in the later stages uh, of the race. Um, he, uh, the President Commodore Sharples uh, explains that uh, despite its late pull from Anchorage, uh, the America, which uh, had a flying jib, you know, which means they basically took the jib and almost used it as a, in the, that light air portion as a as spinnaker kind of situation, they pulled up pretty quickly. Um, and by the time they got to this kind of rounding point, uh, they were within minutes of the remaining um, the other ships uh, that were in the race. So everybody's uh, proceeding along and America is in the pack. Um, as they got farther down, uh, the composition of the, of the race started to change a little bit. Um, the breeze picked up uh, and that was an advantage for America because they were used to, you know, being along the design of these uh, Long Island, not these Long Island, but New, uh, New York Harbor uh, wind. We're used to uh, that kind of wind situation. There was also a little bit of dispute about the course route. This little jutting out piece here uh, that's on the right hand, more rightward side of this picture, there's apparently a lighthouse there. And the, the race, everyone in the race, apparently uh, it was custom for everyone to pass outside of the lighthouse. But America, which apparently really didn't know this, passed inside the lighthouse. And uh, there again, it just, they picked up a bit of an advantage at that point. They had caught up. Uh, then they started to be at least in the front of the pack. Uh, that little maneuver was disputed, but it was ultimately determined that they simply hadn't been properly advised of whether they could go inside or outside the right house. Those are the kind of things that add up to a victory, though, in a, in a race. Um, as they got down to the point where the Commodore is uh, pointing out there, uh, three of the boats actually dropped out of the race. Um, one actually had some damage, another one had a little bit of damage, and the third one stopped to help the other two. Uh, so we're starting, we're starting to, to lose, and some of those, some of those, one or two of those three had been front runners. So America is now starting to pull out uh, substantially in front of the pack as the hours go on. Um, and as by the time they got down to what is basically the halfway uh, point of the race, um, they were they were a good uh, a good half hour or so ahead. And then for the remainder of the race, up way back up to cows, uh, they just they just increased their lead. Um, uh, and arrived at 837, which as you could say, the next closest boat was, uh, you know, 20, 25 minutes behind. Uh, and then it just got worse and worse <laughs> as it went on. So bottom line, America uh, won, won the race. And it just so happens that Queen Victoria and her husband uh, had gotten on their yacht, which is actually more of a small battleship, over there at Osborne House, which we had pointed out is up there near the Royal Yacht Club, had sailed around to something called the Needle. 
And they apparently, I think, sail, my guess is they sail counterclockwise to get to the needles. The needles are that point, you see the Commodore's finger down there at the far southern port of the island. Well, the needles are, if you keep going and you'll see up there at like uh, 11 o'clock, uh, this, this, this protruding thin geological formation which is, appears to be in photos kind of a, a, a chalk, out, a, a rock outgrowth, and it's called the Needles. Well, Queen Victoria, Prince Philip, and their kids on the Royal Small Battleship Yacht uh, had sailed there to be in position to see the boats when, you know, in the race when they came around. Uh, and this is a little uh, excerpt from the Queen's diary where she describes that. And she said, immediately after luncheon, we embarked from our pier in the Victoria and Albert with the six children uh, and all the ladies and gentlemen going with us. Uh, we, skipping ahead, we stopped nearly an hour at Alum Bay. Uh, Alum Bay is a location up there by the Needles. Uh, so that uh, Philip could watch the race better, basically, uh, because he was apparently interested in sailing. He was interested in everything. He was a good, you know, German board progressive prince. Um, and uh, famously, uh, when the, 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 uh, the group of boats in the competition, the first one started to be in view, um, uh, the queen said, who's in first place? And the answer was uh, the America. And she said, oh, that's interesting. And, who, and she said, who's in second place? And the answer was no one. <laughs> and so it dawned on them. Now that's, that may be apocryphal, but that, that is the phrase uh, that the Americans chose to pump thereafter, uh, that there was no second place to the, to the Americans. Um, the day after the race, uh, the Queen invited uh, Commodore Cox and his crew to sail to the, uh, to the dock at Osborne House, where she and the prince and the kids boarded it, boarded the boat, and as she said, she, uh, the Yacht America, is extremely pretty. Uh, in the stern is a round well with seats around it. According to the fashion of our country, as the owner said, uh, this is from her diary, I'm sure she never quite caught Commodore Cox's actual name, there's a great deal of accommodation below and the decorations and fittings are very pretty. Uh, now, the thing about this is this was reported heavily in the British press. Uh, number one, this, this victory in a a race that was not seen to be that important before it occurred, but this American victory, this recognition by the queen, um, all of a sudden bumped this up into a big deal. Um, and uh, the fact that the queen responded graciously to the victory, um, and he enhanced United States uh, prestige at this time. So, this all of a sudden became a big deal. Now remember, at this point, the cup doesn't even have a name. The cup, they're gonna get the cup, which uh, the Marcus of Angsley had just kind of bought as a trophy. Uh, it was like, here, take this trophy, pulled it off the shelf, take this one for this race. Um, and it, it really didn't have a name. It was just known as the 100 pound race cup. Um, when it was uh, was given to the America, it was you know when when they won the race and were were given that trophy and that's all it was. There was no money, nothing of that. It was just here's the cup. Thanks a lot. Um, however, the bottom line is that when the yacht the yacht America sailed to England, they won this hundred pound cup race, and thereafter that cup, became, which is really that you were. Uh, became America's Cup, uh, named not so much after the United States as after, uh, after named after the vessel, the, the yacht America. And so that is sort of the story of how the America's Cup 
started. Uh, and I don't know if anybody wants to sort of discuss stuff or should I forge on? Uh, any, anybody has any questions, wanted to say anything or add anything? Okay, is what it is, but it's kind of a fun story. Apparently another, there are a lot of apocryphal stories about it, but another one is that apparently the, uh, the Marquess of Angersley uh, got on board. Everybody, you know, once the America won, everybody wanted to get on board and take a look at it. And he was actually um, convinced that, that the boat was so fast that it had to have some sort of engine secreted in way inside of it. And when he got on board, he leaned way over the edge to see if he could see any evidence of it, you know, discern evidence of this. And he almost fell overboard, but he had a wooden leg. He had lost his leg in fighting against Napoleon. Uh, and the, the, the story is that at Commodore Cox grabbed him by his uh, wooden leg and saved him from falling overboard. <laughs> so there's just a myriad, you know, it's the kind of, it's a kind of historical situation that has a, a, a myriad of tales, probably, prom many of them promulgated by the Americans themselves when they got back to America, because they dined out a lot on this victory, needless to say. Well, I'm obviously going to fast forward now. Uh, we're going to cover fairly quickly the next 170 years, bringing this up to uh, the present. Um, they're roughly divisible into what I call the New York years. These are the years that the America's Cup competitions actually occurred around New York, either down around Staten Island, or I think some of them may have been in the Sound. Uh, then in the 1930s, um, uh, the competition was moved to Newport, and that was considered kind of the golden age, uh, 1930 to the uh, outset of World War II. Uh, the J-boats uh, came into being as a, a competing class during that period, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, after the war, um, uh, we moved into what are called 1980s, uh, the San Diego years, when everything started to get kind of pumped up and merchandised and uh, pop culture. And then now we're presently in what I call the global years, which is that the competition now has virtually no tie to the United States per se, other than the fact that the New York Yacht Club still owns the America's Cup. So uh, when the way, the way the competition, so we have how the Americans got this cup, uh, you know, uh, and the fact that it was called America's Cup actually had, is ex post facto to that 100 pound race that the, the Royal Yacht Club was running. That was, that had nothing to do with something called the America's Cup. But when the Americans got back, they basically institutionalized having this cup uh, and defending this cup uh, as the, the America's Cup con co uh, competition. And they did this basically, remember this was, uh, even though all the, the uh, consortium of business people that funded the America yacht to go to Britain, when they received the cup, they kind of personally owned that trophy. And for about a year, they kind of shared it among themselves, you know, had it on the dinner table at dinner parties, had it on the, you know, shelf over the fireplace. Um, it was, you know, and as I said, told all these stories, they, you know, made sure press people got hold of it. Uh, but at, at, at the end of the year, they actually formally deeded the cup from their personal ownership to the, uh, Roy, the New York City Yacht Club as trustees of the cup and in doing doing that that uh donation they did it via a document a written document called the deed of gift of the america's cup and it's kind of like the written constitution of the united states <laughs> it set forth 
the terms, the protocol, where they basically made an offer to yacht clubs all over the world to come and win this America's Cup from them. So they were putting themselves in the position of, in their mind, perpetual defenders of the America's Cup. And the nature of the competition would be, you come, you challenge us for the cup, and if you win, you get to take the cup back home to your yacht club. No prize money, nothing of that. It's strictly passing around the, um, the possession of this trophy, which is kind of mind blowing when you realize the amount of money spent on this little round robin of having possession of this, you know, three foot high silver ewer, but that's what it is. And it was this deed of trust that made the America's Cup competition a thing. Um, this happens to be uh, uh, from a YouTube, this guy, uh, Terry Hutchinson, did a little short YouTube about how he went to visit the New York Yacht Club, which uh, now is located in New York City, uh, the headquarters of the Yacht Club. It's no longer in Hoboken, New Jersey. And the archivist of the New York Yacht Club, uh, uh, we'll see her picture in a moment, pulled out this actual deed document, which is kind of um, uh, uh, pictured here on the bottom, along the bottom of the page. Uh, so it's to be a perpetual challenge trophy to promote friendly competition among the nations. Okay. Uh, the deed itself, and I won't go through all of this, but just to show you, uh, addresses very specifically to some degree of let's let's put it this way to a, a seeming degree of specificity what the protocol of the competition was to be um uh, any country shall any uh, a yacht club of any country shall always be entitled to write a, a right of sailing uh you know a vessel in a competition if they're properly oops qualified um they had to be propelled by sails only and had to be constructed in the company to which the challenging club belongs. Uh, and then it sets forth uh, waterline lengths. As we saw, America was 89 feet at waterline math. If it's one mass, because America was a schooner, two mass, uh, it should be not less than 44 feet nor more than 90. And if it was more than one mass, presumably two, not less than 80 and not more than 115. Um, uh, then they talk a little bit about the, the races. At this point, there were to be basically three races and how they were reconstructed and that there was a timeline. They were to be completed within seven hours. Uh, in the history of the competition, there were occasions when the wind was so light that they couldn't even com complete the course within, say, it's a seven hours. So they just would call it off that day and do it the next day. Now, all of these highlights, and there were more, the document is two pages, basically, as, as shown in the picture here. Um, all of these are every, practically every word <laughs> has over the course of the 170 years been disputed in one respect or another. Um, the, the deed of trust remains, but it's gone to court, it's been interpreted, it's been argued about, there's been negotiations, um, it's been part of uh, the America's Cup tradition, and that's why I had in the title of the presentation that the America's Cup is not just about um, beautiful boats and wonderful sailing, it's also about a lot of bickering, and the bickering is over the, the, the language of this foundational document. Uh, the New York, once that was established, and it, it kind of got squared away by 1857, uh, this donation protocol, uh, the New York uh, Yacht Club uh, held the cup for the next 132 years uh, until 1983 when the Australians took it. Um, uh, uh, there were 25 competitions during that 
that time. So it's not like it's every year or even every, it's now pretty regularly every three years, but the time it wasn't. The first challengers uh, for the cup did not emerge until 1871 after the initial deed of trust uh, in the 1850s. So this was kind of a sporadic thing that was, that was established. Um, but the way the, you know, and again, of course, anyone who challenged for the cup had to come to the Americans' uh, home waters. So they always had the advantage and they optimized that advantage uh, as, as the years went on. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these, but this will give you, this is, you know, a quick listing and a picture of some of the boats. Uh, you can see how the, def the, uh, the other thing too is when the, when a challenger notified the New York Yacht Club that they did want to challenge for the cup, uh, there were times specified, you know, they had to give them up to 10 months notice. Uh, and with that notice, they had to describe what kind of vessel they were going to bring to challenge the New York Yacht Club, whatever vessel the New York Yacht Club put in the water to defend the cup. Uh, and you can see that when we had notice, that kind of notice of what the challengers were going to bring, we then designed our boats, which are on the left, the challengers are pictured on the right, to be very similar and hopefully better than whatever the design was they were bringing. And with the home water advantage, with the advantage of you know knowing what design the challengers were going to bring, and our own little tricks, uh, we just consistently won. Um, this is, you know, and the other thing is at during this period, uh, most of the challengers were from the British Commonwealth. Initially, they were England, there were some from Canada, uh, and and then Scotland as well as time went on. Um, uh, but it was basically a yin and yang between England and America. It was it was not international global in that regard. Not that there, anyone was excluded, presumably, but that was just the nature of the race of, of who was interested in participating in that in the race at that time. Um, the Brits, be they Scots or Canadians or whomever, uh, started to complain a lot that they were losing so much. And they were complaining that, that they were basically being cheated in a variety of ways um, for it, and that it was not a fair race. Uh, for example, um, in some of uh, the Americans' early bo boats, since they knew the waters well, they replaced the keel with a centerboard. Uh, and a centerboard, if you can maneuver the boat, as you all know, will always, when you raise that centerboard, you're going to go faster than a, a ship with comparable sail uh, coverage uh, that is, however, dragging a keel along for state stability. Um, and it was that kind of it, what uh, the Brits considered irregularity in competition. Uh, that they would complain about. They would always complain, nothing would come of it, and they basically would go home as losers. <laughs> uh, but this fellow, Dunn Raven, apparently was one of the most um, vociferous about it all. Uh, and, but it didn't dissuade him from trying. He tried a couple of times. Uh, and uh, controversy just became part of the America's Cup. Controversy over the terms of the race given that deed of the interpretation of that deed of trust and our, i.e. the United States, the New York Yacht Club's uh, canniness in kind of working around. And of course, they were always the, they were always the ultimate arbiters as well <laughs> uh, of what, what the deed of trust said. But challengers kept coming. Um, here we move up uh, all the way up till uh, 1920. Um, we had uh, contenders. Uh, you'll see over there on the left of the right, Miss, the Earl of Dunraven, the fellow we just saw, he, he kept trying. And then Sir Thomas Lipton. Lipton is the Lipton of Lipton T. 
uh, decided to get into the, into the game. Now, this in a way, from the British side of things, indicated a new era of who were participating in these kind of things. Um, up to this point, you basically still had aristocrats, uh, rich, aristoc titled aristocrats playing, you know, the New York, uh, I mean, the Royal Yacht Squadron game. But now you now had uh, non-titled, although they might get, you know, knighted uh, in, uh, at the height of their successful career. But these are basically business people now. Uh, Lipton was a business people. Lipton Tea made all his money growing tea in India and bringing it to, to England. Uh, he's now wealthy enough and influential enough in British society to actually mount what is the more, one of the more prestigious activities of the you know, British Haute uh, so High Society. Uh, however, he was also uh, unsuccessful and uh, New York Yacht Club just kept winning and winning and winning. And um, the sailage, uh, the, some of these boats in these latter phases here, before there was, you know, the New York Yacht Club did start to rec regularize the, re the boat requirements a little. The basic sail structure just got crazier and crazier on this, these boats. They just were, it was all about finding how much sail can you put on the boats. And some of them are described as being, you know, kind of freakish. In any event, uh, in 1930, uh, the race was moved to Newport. And all of a sudden we had a new era. It wasn't so much of a, a, a free for all. There was going to be a standard boat design. By this time too, uh, the competition was narrowed down to one challenger and one, one defender, basically. Uh, it wasn't an open race where you had 15 boats sailing or any of that nature. You had two. Where there were multiple challengers, there would be pre-racers to sort of narrow down the challengers. Um, and uh, these J boats, I'm not going to go into all the design about them, but the picture kind of speaks for itself. They, they are gorgeous boats. And this is, as I mentioned earlier, is considered kind of the, uh, you know, the classic glory period of the type of elegant sailing associated at that time with the America's, America's Cup competition. Um, uh, that ended with the outset of the World War II. And uh, race, this is another big picture I just included in simply because it's just so beautiful. They're of course still built, but you can just see the hull design is, it, it's like their lines are just utterly beautiful. Um, uh, after the war, sailing resumed in, in Newport. Uh, however, some different classes of boats, classes other than the J boat, uh, emerged over this time. But you can see by the pictures on the left and the right, of the left being the defender, right being the challenger, that now we're in the era of what uh, might be called fair racing. Uh, the two boats were the same type of boat, and so it became not so much about the boat, although each of the owners would kind of try to, you know, gear up their within that design, standard design framework to do as many little tricks and cuts as they could get away with. Uh, but it was more about the uh, sailing expertise of the crew. Uh, that went on uh, through the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, uh, until in 1983, the hammer came down. And we lost the cup. Oh, during this period, too, post-World War II, you start seeing Australia show up. All of a sudden, it's not just about Great Britain and America, but it's also about so, so a place as far away as Australia, for heaven's sakes. And again, these are Australian entre business entrepreneurs that were starting to see participation in this competition, a prestige and status item, which obviously it is. And in 1983, Alan Bond, who was a famous kind of flamboyant businessman in Australia, uh, his yacht, um, the Australia, 
uh, defeated our, our, our yacht, the Liberty. And so for the first time in however many hundred and some odd years, uh, the America's Cup was no longer in America. It was taken away to the Royal Perth Yacht Club. Um, and one of the ways they did it, that's Alan Bond there on the left uh, holding up the cup, is they had one of the tricks they played within the um, framework of the uh, boat design standards for that particular race was they had something called a winged keel. Uh, and as you can see, uh, this is a very different kind of keel. Uh, it, it sort of adds these two flaps at the bottom of it, which had not been done before. Um, this is, there's Prince Charles looking at it kind of quizzically. Uh, and for whatever, you know, nautical engineering reason, it gave them the advantage that won the, the America's Cup and uh, in 1983. Now I put on here, but then had to give it back after court litigation. That's, that's wrong, forgive me, that's, that's incorrect. That was a later race. Uh, they retained the cup uh, and, whoops, went the wrong way. Uh, interestingly, one of the crew members who were on the Liberty, the American Liberty that lost the cup to the Australians was this fellow named Dennis Connor. Uh, and basically he made it his aim in life to get the cup back for America. Uh, and so he got a consortium of uh, businessmen. Uh, they mounted a challenge, not from the New York Yacht Club, but from the San Diego Yacht Club. So now we have a situation where the New York Yacht Club is not involved at all, uh, except for the fact that the cup is still theirs officially and the protocol of the race is determined by the, the protocol associated with the deed of gift of the cup to them. But now we're dealing with completely different players. Well, in any event, Connor went down there, uh, won the cup back, uh, and brought it back to uh, the um, uh, to San Diego, uh, whereupon San Diego, uh, uh, the Australians challenged San Diego to get it back again, uh, and were joined by uh, New Zealand. And in the pre-race, uh, there were several uh, challengers, New Zealand, Australia, some from Britain. Uh, New Zealand emerged as the main challenger. They came up to San Diego and Connor floated out a catamaran. Now, if you recall in the protocol, uh, New Zealand protested and said, wait a minute, that's a catamaran, that's not, a sailing yacht, uh, and uh, the San Diego Yacht Club and Mr. Connor said, show us in the, the deed of trust where we can't have uh, two hulls. There's nothing in the deed of trust that says anything about the number of hulls. It went to court, it went to appellate courts, went up and down. Bottom line is uh, Connor, the, the San Diego Yacht Club prevailed and they held on to the cup. Uh, but it goes to show the, the kind of finagling that we're into. And it's all big money, too, because these are expensive, expensive disputes, not only in terms of lawyering involved, but also in terms of the engineering of these, these vessels um, and the secrecy and the marketing and all of, you know, the hoopla around it. Um, this is a picture of that catamaran which, you know, that certainly doesn't look like a J-boat. Um, it certainly doesn't look like the America, but the courts held that it fell within the terms of the deed of trust. And so Connor was able to sail it in defense of the cup against New Zealand that had a mono hull. Uh, and you'll also notice that all of a sudden we're getting this, it may have been prior to this, but this is the first picture I've seen of it, where we've got marketing. We've got Marlboro all over. The name of the ship was actually the Stars and Stripes. 
but we've got Marlboro sort of uh, prominently displayed because these enterprises have gotten so expensive uh, that the money is needed. Uh, they're because there's such sort of luxury status events. Um, advertisers want to be in on it. Um, and there's nothing to preclude them from, from that happening. There was nothing in the deed of trust that said you can't put advertisements on the sales. So all the bounds are starting to be, you know, uh, pushed. Um, they have to be because it's so expensive to keep it going. And also because it's now, you know, it's not just a stuffy ass aristocratic and wealthy sportsman kind of activity. Uh, although it is at some level, but it's now moved into the modern era. It's getting, the race is getting TV coverage, not just newspaper coverage. Uh, these controversies are entertaining too. It's something for all the press people to write about. Uh, well, in any event, uh, this era that, you know, we had the New York era, we had the Newport era, and now we have the, uh, what I call the relatively short lives, but nonetheless, uh, consistent San Diego era, which lasted up till 1995. Um, uh, uh, at that point, when uh, uh, after uh, Connor defended it against the New Zealanders, uh, the Italians challenged, they defended it against the Italians, although at that point, I think they were back to sailing a mono hull. They didn't do a catamaran. Um, and then finally in 1995, they lost it again to uh, New Zealand, the cup. But at this point, the competition is opened up. And I think the idea of an American yacht club losing the cup uh, simply doesn't have quite the same um, uh, significance that it had uh, in the earlier history of the race. Uh, now it's all about uh, a global endeavor as to who can get position, uh, has the money and the, the mojo to seize possession of this, uh, of this trophy. Um, so in any event, at this point, we're down in New Zealand. And this is what I call the global phase. We're basically, you know, New, New Zealand defended it against the, an Italian yacht club. They then lost it against the Swiss yacht club, the Swiss yacht club, lost it back to the United States, uh, to the Golden Gate Yacht Club. That was the year it was, uh, the competition was sailed in the San Francisco Bay. And that picture I have of the trophy with the Golden Gate in the background probably comes from that. Uh, when the Golden Gate Yacht Club was challenged by uh, the, again, by the Royal U New Zealand Yacht Club, uh, the, the defense was mounted by uh, Larry Orison, uh, Larry, that's the wrong name, but the owner, the founder of Oracle uh, uh, put, mounted a huge, uh, he used a catamaran. Uh, defended it against that challenge, uh, but then in the next 2017, where they moved it, uh, the, the defending club, uh, the Golden Gate Yacht Club, because the San Francisco waters were, winds weren't quite good for the race, so they moved it to a beautiful place, uh, Bermuda, in 2017, but when they moved it, they lost it. New Zealand got it again. And that's kind of the setup for the 2021s where the, uh, the races that were just finished occurred down in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, which kind of brings us to today and brings us to hydrofoils, uh, which are an incredible innovation uh, in the whole look of and how sales occur. Um, now, hydrofoils per se aren't a new concept, but a yacht sailing hydrofoil is, uh, are these arms, as we'll see, and you all probably know, basically reach out from the, the, the hull on either side and kind of look like they're like two arms and they're putting their hand down on the water and lifting the hull up out of the water such that the sailboat is literally sailing. 
What's the advantage of this? Well, aside from the novelty, it doubles the speed. These boats, you know, a typical, like the America probably at top speed was doing about 16 knots or about, you know, somewhere between 50 and 20 miles an hour at its top speed. These hydrofoils easily go with the right wind. And again, these are all still wind driven. They're sailboats, uh, can go 55 miles an hour. It's astonishing. Um, motored, uh, uh, Motorboats with huge engines lag beside the lag when they're trying to just to, to move along beside them. Um, it, uh, hydrofoil can occur with either a monohull or a multi-hull, like a, a, a catamaran. And uh, since the uh, 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 I think 2013 race, all those variations have um, have been tried. And now I just really I'm going to show a bunch of you know, some pictures of these boats because the pictures kind of um, explain it. Uh, this is uh, New Zealand's boat entry in the San Francisco competition in 23. Uh, this shows their hydrofoil. Now here, the hydrofoil engineering, you can see it there, uh, to the bottom, the right side of the ca catamaran, right hull of the, the starboard hull of this catamaran, you can see the advertisement for camper. And you see that kind of bar there reaching up. They literally just manually uh, raise those up and down, almost like a center board, to tell you the truth. It, it, same kind of manual operation, but it's actually engineered to lift the boat up uh, and take the, and thus eliminating the friction of the hull passing through the water. It's astonishing. And the New Zealanders in it brought that to the America's Cup. It, hydrofoiling was being done throughout the world of sailing, but it had not been brought to the America's Cup. And actually the New Zealanders introduced this in the trials in 2012. And they were the first ones, when they arrived, when they appeared with this in the trials, everybody was just, flabbergasted when they put those hydrofoils arms into action and the boat lifted up off the water. Everybody was like, oh my God. Um, of course, when they challenged the, the uh, San Francisco Yacht Club for, for the cup, they had to send their design. And the San Francisco Yacht Club at that point, uh, which had planned to run, this was uh, Larry Ellison of uh, Oracle, had planned to sail a catamaran as um, Connor had done so many years earlier, but they had not had hydrofoils, I don't believe it. I believe that when they saw those hydrofoils, they added that technology to their catamaran uh, defender uh, boat. Um, and uh, this, yeah, this is another picture of the New Zealand boat. Again, you can kind of see how those arms are operating on either hull, uh, lifting it up. It's, it's amazing. This is a, these are from some YouTube. So if you'd like to see them actually sailing, uh, the YouTubes are amazing. And you can see the San Francisco, uh, uh, geography in the background there. Uh, that must have been must have been quite a sight in 2013. Um, this uh, is a picture. Me, did did yeah. Allison himself participated in the races? Uh, I don't know that. I don't know. I don't, I'm inclined to say I don't think so, but I could be wrong about that. Yeah, but he, but he uh, contributed, right? He, he built the boat, right? He basically owned it. You know, now, now we're getting into the era of just like we had Lipton, the tea millionaire back in the day, uh, and Bond, the sort of mercantile uh, entrepreneur in coming from Australia. Uh, we've now got the American tech millionaires involved in the race. Naturally, again, it's a status item. If you've got, got multi-hundreds of millions of dollars, you, you know, you can buy a race horse and a race car and a racing yacht to defend in the most prestigious, uh, most prestigious competition in the world for yachting. Uh, as I mentioned, the San Francisco Yacht 
when they were challenged in 2017, they elected to take the race, had the race occur not in their home waters of the San Francisco Bay, but moved it to Bermuda. Uh, this is the Oracle boat showing it's high, it had a, you know, it's hydrofoil catamaran uh, profile. Um, nice to have Oracle <laughs> advertising there. I thought this was a great photo uh, showing what is uh, not the America, but certainly a boat like the America and just what the, what the contrast is, uh, you know, how far it's come over 170 years. Um, this is another picture. There's the uh, Challenger Emirates and uh, the Oracle. Um, again, you know, it's fun to look at the YouTube videos because, you know, it, it, it's quite astonishing how these things maneuver. And again, these are going up to 55 miles an hour. These are not the old graceful U-boats kind of from a spectator's point of view, kind of having a stately progress forward in, in you know, uh, kind of everybody following the wind in the same way. These, these, these competitions look and feel very, very different. They almost feel more like race cars than, uh, than yachts. Um, but that's, that's the way of the world. Whoever can go faster, and it is a competition to get across the finish line first. So um, if the look and feel of it changes, that's just a, you know, a byproduct. Um, this is the 2021 New Zealand uh, Auckland successfully defended when they took it from in Bermuda they did they did take the cup uh, from uh, the Americans from Ellison uh, they oops good throw away they in just a couple of weeks ago, they successfully defended keeping the cup. Uh, instead of doing a catamaran, they did a mono hull. And now, as you can see, these hydrofoil arms are much more sophisticated. They're not that sort of, um, as you recall, this sort of clunky, uh, this is a good picture, but almost like sticks, like center boards that they raised up and down. Uh, they now are these, these very sophisticated engineering apparatus. Um, they are raised up and down manually um, by, the, um, by the crew. There's a lot of press out there pre-race about the crew getting all buffed up and be how fast they can, you know, do these winders. And it's still a sailboat. So there are times when the hydrofoils are drawn back in, the boat heels, everybody has to be constantly running around. And there's an incredible amount of sophisticated computerized navigational information packed into these vessels now. Uh, in the America's Cup, I didn't mention it, but, but by the 1930s, many of the America's Cup's crews, either defenders or challengers, had crew members like mathematicians, <laughs> um, you know, which meant that they were getting into a certain navigational sophistication regarding the race routes and the wind conditions and the water conditions that was beginning to be beyond, just beyond the typical, you know, gentleman yachts, yachtsman's know-how. And now that has, you know, modern times just ratcheted up. I think there's a lot of, um, on land uh, computer uh, navigational analysis going on while the race is occurring, which I'm assuming they are able to radio to the skipper of the ships. And, you know, the skipper then makes the accordingly the sail and hydrofoil uh, adjustments. Um, and this is a picture too, because you can see there's that motorboat off to the left kind of going at full throttle and they're barely keeping up uh, with this, uh, with New Zealand's hydrofoil monohull. How often uh, did they run, uh, by the way? How often? Uh, those you races? mean how many? Uh, now, now, years, now they, it's not a set time. Like I said, the first one didn't occur till uh, 20 years after the original race in Britain. Um, and they were interrupted by the world wars, etc. Nowadays, it is about every three, it, it's about a three year um, space. Uh, it, you know, uh, three years 
between when a challenger gives notice that they want to challenge and to when the race occurs. And what happens is that three years is aside from building the boats and all of the crews and all of all of that that's going on, uh, you have you, you nowadays have usually have about three three to five challengers. So there have to be these runoff races to narrow it down to uh, the Prada Cup race is a big one um, where they narrow down the challengers to just one. So all of that takes at least 36 months uh, or can take longer. So they have uh, uh, other races before correct. only two uh, leaders emerge. Right? That's exactly right. And again, that's that was an innovation in the course of the history of the America's Cup. Um, originally, they didn't they didn't do that. It was a one on one. You know, the challenger challenged, and there were whoever was the first to challenge was going to be in the race. Uh, they didn't have a runoff among numerous challengers. But now now it's all part of the game. Um, the New York Yacht Club did have an entry in the 2021 races. It was called America's American Magic. Uh, unfortunately, they went down in the Prada Cup semifinals. Um, and to see one of these big hydrofoils go down, again, this is, this is a photo. There's several YouTube videos of it out there. Because uh, you can imagine all the thousands of people and the people in those motorboats that are skimming around, a lot of those are press people with cameras and there's helicopters overhead with cameras. You know, it's like football games, you know, pro football games are now. When you go to the stadium, the spectators are set secondary. It's all about the TV cameras down on the, down on the field. And that's kind of the way these races have gotten. But when one of these hydrofoils standing up on its legs goes down, it goes down hard, and that's what happened to the American Magic. So you, it's it's tragic in a way because fortunately nobody got hurt. Um, but I mean, the amount of effort and money involved for when one of these things just go crash and burn, it's it's gotta hurt to watch if you're the owner. Um, this is what it looked like when it you know. They, it, it completely turned over. Uh, they were able to make repairs. All the other boats, remember the deed of gifts said this is a friendly, comp friendly competition among nations. So the other, the other participants in the semifinals contributed apparently to helping get the repairs done. And within a couple of days, they actually would, they stopped the semifinals so they could make the repairs. They made the repairs, but at that point, they still lost. They they were cut out of the uh, semifinals, um, but you can see how you know this gives you a sideline view of this, the bare boneness of these ships. Um, they're not like they're not pretty the way Queen Victoria said America was pretty with a little semicircle of seats with cushions on them in the back. Um, these are like utility tanks. Uh, you know, war tanks, um, that berth there that you can see those two guys kind of at the top of the picture, that's where the, the, the winders sit to wind this arm up and down. It's a, it's a whole different vehicle. The sail material now is completely different as well. And there's no, um, there's very little sail manipulation uh, uh, in, in terms of, um, the lines, uh, the way you uh, configured the sale itself. Um, just a few fun facts. The entry fee for the America's Cup in 2020 was, there is an entry fee, $2 million. Not only do you not get a money prize, you have to pay to participate in it. Um, the cost of uh, running the team, uh, the boats themselves, the support crews, uh, the whole infrastructure, uh, runs to many millions of dollars. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of the few actual figures I could find in Googling around was that it's commonly said that in 2013, Ellison spent around 200 million. And I'm sure that's probably an underestimation. Um, these things are just incredibly expensive. And when you think it is only about possession of that silver ewer, um, 
Of course, there's all the ancillary. The marketing people get to put advertisements on the boat. It gets a lot of press. I think the eng any anybody associated with an America's Cup challenger or defender, engineering teams, uh, nautical architectural teams, that's got to be a huge professional credential. So there's a lot going on, needless to say, but there's no cash. So I, I think I'll add Commodore Cox would be kind of disinterested in all of this uh, in that regards if he couldn't wage just a plain old wager. Although I'm sure there's some wagers going on in the background. Uh, there has already been a challenger to New Zealand. The race was just a couple weeks ago, but already a team from the Royal Yacht Squadron has entered a challenge uh, for whenever the next race is, speculatively 2024. Uh, they're going to be captained by a modern god of sailing, Sir Ben and Ainsley, uh, who has you know, won many Olympic gold medals. He actually raced in, they were, they had a, a uh, England had a boat in the 2021, but they didn't make it out of the uh, semifinals. So we're on the way for the next gigantically, incredibly expensive confab of the America's Cup. It goes on. People still want to do it. Um, and a little postscript, whatever happened to the America and where's the America's Cup today? Well, the America had a fairly kind of sad dem demise. Uh, it, uh, Stevens actually did not bring the America back to the United States after they won. He left, he sold it to somebody in England. So that, that you know, kind of gives you an insight into their mentality. They did not have an affection for this particular vessel. It was just a, a means to the end. They left it behind when it achieved what they wanted, and they went back home and probably built other yachts. Um, the America went through a succession of British owners. It then came back to America. It actually was sailed a bit in the Civil War on just some sort of... Um, you know, shuttling uh, supplies sort of thing. Uh, it came into the possession of the Navy uh, eventually and after some more private owners and ultimately made its way down here near me to Annapolis. It was kept under the auspices of the Naval Academy uh, till they somehow relinquished it, it to a private owner uh, or private warehousing firm here in Annapolis. And in 19, uh, here in Annapolis, in Annapolis, I'm in Washington. <clears throat> it was it was pretty degraded. It was, uh, no, there had been no upkeep. Obviously it was all wood. The wood was in bad shape. It didn't have its mast, no sails obviously, but the hull was still there. But under a heavy snowfall, the roof of the shed collapsed, and then all whatever was left at that point was just hauled off to a trash dump. And in this little article where I got that information is actually from an Annapolis, a local Annapolis reporter, and he says there are still many native Annapolis people who swear they've got a piece of the America. <laughs> so uh, if you get yourself a piece of wood in Annapolis, I think you can probably make that claim. Um, who's going to dispute you? Uh, the cup itself, of course, still lives. Um, it was, it's interesting that in 19, 1852, again, this is back when they had first returned with the cup, uh, Commodore Cox and his buddies and brothers had returned. They almost melted it down into medallions for the members of the winning team. That would have been something, which gives you, again, uh, some insight into the fact that it was not the prestige item then that it is now in the sense of being sacrosanct in and of itself. Uh, jumping forward in 1997, while the cup was in New Zealand, uh, political activists, uh, who was interested in rights of the Maori tribes in uh, uh, New Zealand, uh, attacked the trophy with a sledgehammer. It was somewhat damaged, but Gerards of London, who are still in existence, the original uh, silversmiths of the cup, um, repaired it, 
And it now travels with two security protection agents, which is more than the America yacht ever got. Um, the names of the 34 William teams are engraved on the a trophy, which they've added to the base of the uh, trophy. You can see it's gone from 27 inches to 44 inches. The base has been added to in order to keep inscribing all their names. Um, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, Ellison, when he won the 33rd America's Cup, uh, replaced the base with the same carbon fiber and that their yacht was made out of at that time. Because of course, hull technology has evolved incredibly. Uh, and it now travels around the world in a custom design Louis Vuitton case, which was made and presented for her, she's now a her, 150th anniversary, and she flies in business or first class wherever she goes and is enrolled herself in many frequent flyer programs. Uh, and here's the team just a couple of weeks ago, the New Zealand team, the cup. It, it's, loca its specific location may be undisclosed, but its general location right now is Auckland, New Zealand. Um, and there it is after 170 years. And if you happen to be in Auckland, New Zealand today, actually yesterday, given the time difference, uh, you can see the cup uh, along with a 80% off clearance sale of every Team, Emirates team memorabilia. So the marketing goes on. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Okay. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah, it's a lot of new information. I, I only had a vague idea, occasionally a look, but never realized how advanced it's so uh, nowadays. Why is it called Emirates uh, team? Uh, I think because there's a company, it may be a technology company, like a telecommunications company uh, in New Zealand called Emirates. So they call it the Emirates team uh, boat, um, kind of like Ellison and it being Oracle. But the boat sails on behalf of the New Zealand Yacht Club, because again, remember the protocol of the gift of deeds is it's only a yacht club that can challenge. So basically these businessmen approach a yacht club and say, if you all will challenge, we'll bring the boat. And of course they bring the boat with all their advertisement all over it. <laughs> well, I think the, uh, the Emirates, uh, I don't know if, you know, and I can check that on Google, but there is uh, Man City is also uh, Manchester City soccer club is being supported by um, Fly Emirates. And I think yeah. maybe, maybe that, that related because I think Saudi Saudis are trying to divert from the uh, oil needle to other uh, perspective, which is sports management and um, and other things like investments. I know they own like 60% uh, of Mercedes these days. <laughs> and so yeah. it's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, they might be off the needle soon, off the oil needle. So who knows? <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So no, that's exa I think you're exactly right. There's some, you know, global conglomerate. Um, so. Yeah. Well, uh, this was incredible. I, I've actually learned so much. And now I'm yeah, gonna... it's very. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it is. That's why I wanted to do it because, uh, why well, I suggested doing it because it's more interesting than you might think <laughs> in yeah. modern times, you know. Um, you also will be presenting, um, I don't remember which date, I think it was in, in July, right? Or May, uh, June or July, yeah. June, right. Uh, it's how the, the transference of Aristotle back to Europe from Arab lands. I'm thinking we should probably just to get more people in, uh, change it. There might be um, if you if you, if you want, and it's up to you. Philosophy um, in Arab and Europe European lands, you know, we can say the seven hundreds or nine hundreds, whenever that happened, and something like that. And then this way you can talk about Aristotle, and then we can have Aristotle in the you know in a, in parentheses that we'll talk about specifically Aristotle, but. This way, it would get like a more broader subject of philosophy. Whatever. 
I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, like I said, I like smaller groups <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and I will, I will be kind of focusing on the mechanics of it rather than the actual um, substance of the philosophy. In other words, I want to try to trace what is kind of the, you know, almost like the manuscript trail from whenever Aristotle committed this stuff to writing, presumably, how did it move um, through Greece, through Egypt, through Arabia, uh, various routes into Europe, not just the one that, you know, is the traditional narrative. So that, that's what I'll kind of be looking at more. So, you know, rephrase it however you want, but it won't really be about the substance of the philosophy. Um, and, you know, if that's a smaller interest group, that's a smaller interest group. But it's kind of like the America's Cup. I think it's more interesting than you might, than you might think. And I think it's key to know so that, you know, we have an idea about what are we talking about? Are we talking about fragments? Are we talking about entire coherent pieces? Are we talking about seven, 800 year gaps? <laughs> where there was nothing and then all of a sudden there's something well what does that mean about that something that just appeared 700 years later uh so it, it's more um you you know you might almost call it like um detective work about the manuscripts of aristotle from when he wrote them to uh to modern times uh, and the other thing too is that it also gets to the you know the standard narrative that Aristotle uh, and Plato uh, came to Europe out of nowhere from, you know, first from Spain, um, from, uh, from the Arabist, uh, and, but then also the Medici in, you know, um, Italy. And the Medici, you know, brought Greek philosophy and we had the Renaissance. Well, that, you know, needless to say, is very reductionist as to what... Right. What, what the evolution, and I just think it's worth going through once so everybody's heard it. Like when you hear people make these assertions, um, kind of put it in this context, a little more context of exactly, because it's amazing how these narratives get out there. You see it in the meetup groups, you know, a standard narrative and everybody repeats it and repeats it. It's like, well, wait a minute, it was a little more there's a little more finesse to it than that. And it, it goes to claims like, you know, the Medici discovered Greek philosophy and therefore was the Renaissance, you know, mm, well, it kind of. Certainly the uh, uh, migration from Constantinople uh, uh, played a big role in this too. It brought a lot, I mean, prior to the collapse of the TV. In, uh, no, exactly. Well, that was exactly what it was. You know, the Medici yeah. brought the folks from Constantinople, but you know, where where were the folks in Constantinople keeping it? And how long had they had whatever it was they had? Not just Aristotle, but and, you know, the major, yeah. the, any of the major Greek philosophers, Plato, etc. What were what were the the archives where they they kept these things? Um, how did the Arabs get it? How did that migration occur from Greece towards the east? Where did the Arabs keep it? No, the Arabs. Not just the yeah, Arabs, the Arabs I should, yeah, clearly Alexandria was a major uh, uh, center of uh, cultural center uh, during the Greek times. So I I I, I would assume I, I didn't do the research. I assume uh, the, the Arabs yeah. got a lot from there. Uh, uh, you know, but I, I, even in ancient times, uh, in the Roman times, um, uh, you know, uh, certainly such centers, Constantinople, accumulated a huge libraries and uh, uh, information. Uh, uh, but yeah, and through the Spain, definitely. And and what's interesting is uh, just came to mind that uh, you know the the idea of the medieval Europe that they they accepted geocentric idea. The, that we call Ptolemyan idea is really originated uh, uh, from uh, Aristotle. You know, the Ptolemies uh, much later really got so it, it's a, a geocentric idea is is really Aristotelian idea, which kind of, in a way, later on held back the science. Uh, you know, because uh, everyone was uh, so much um, uh, invested into this geocentric idea. I'm talking about the uh, once the uh, others, the scientists like Copernicus and Galileo, started yeah. telling that. So, anyway, that's what what I would try to do in a presentation. Is is kind of um, 
you know, uh, work out a little more specifically what we know about how those manuscripts were diffused and disseminated. And um, so that, you know, again, we have a better idea of exactly what it is we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. What so we have perfect. today. Yeah. 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 So I'm going to do, do a little bit of description then um, on the, uh, on the thing. I won't change the subject matter. I'll just, you know, give it a. Yeah. Yeah. I think that I don't want anybody to be disappointed. <laughs> I don't want to do any <laughs> false well, advertising. No, it's, it is very interesting. Uh, but to me, Just, uh, I, I, people, I, I, people, you know, I don't know about the date, uh, you know, that uh, I think I have something else. I think, yeah, well, you, you know, Zach can switch it around, I guess. And I wanted to delay it a little because I have to do a little more research. I mean, I didn't, you know, unlike the yeah. America's Cup, which is kind of fun, and I, I know a little bit about it. I knew a little bit about it starting off and had an idea of how I wanted to do the story. Yeah. This would be kind of new stuff for me. And, and you know, so I want to I wanna be accurate. Um, um. Uh, maybe not now, maybe you can think about even September or August, but I want to do um, spy agencies, world spy agencies, KGB, Masada, oh, you know, um, 007, whatever it is, the Scotland Yard, <laughs> you know, do all those spy agencies and kind of like a do like an overall overview. Would that something interest you and maybe in August or September or something like that in overall? I think you get a lot of attendees for that one if you if you told people I think why it, they... and uh, got frozen again. I think. Oh. James Bond aspect of it, etc. Yeah. James, uh, James where, where do you where do where do you live? Uh, are you um, downtown Manhattan? No, I'm uh, uh, actually at Lincoln Center. Oh, oh, I see. my building is actually on top of Lincoln Center, a part of Lincoln Center. Um, uh -huh. So that's where I am. But uh, in the summer, um, if I'm not on these videos, if I'm not doing some sort of work, um, I'm out sailing. So you're all very okay. welcome to come out. <laughs> yeah, I, I, kinda, I have this malware on my you know, scanning system on my device, and I have it set up pretty high where it scans every couple hours. And I think when that scans, um, uh -huh. it pops me off. But I always... Consequently, you, get you could and schedule it uh, when uh, at night, uh, you know. Once uh, I, I know, like I said, I, I have had some, um, you know, work stuff that involved like uh, I see. You other, need and, and, I, and I, I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick this thing off. <laughs> to where right. I'm, uh, it's scanning like every couple hours just for the heck of it, and you know that's that's always a trade-off. You know, you're more secure, but a little less convenient. Things happen, but I've sort of yeah. left it in that. And as long as I can pop right back on, it's it's not a problem. Sure. Yeah, I, I recall you. By the way, mentioned you were the, in the Chesapeake Bay. You know, and just I recall that I I learned a lot about this area by reading James Michener book. Uh, yes. Pacific. Have you read that? You yes, know? I have. And as a matter of fact, uh, yeah, that tome, the Chesapeake. Right, right, right. Uh, Chesapeake. As, yes. When I was much, much younger, um, my first career was as a hospital administrator, and I worked at Hopkins, and I lived in Baltimore. Uh, and uh, once I went to a restaurant in Baltimore, it was kind of an, an old established restaurant, not the normal place I would go, uh, with some friends from, from colleagues from work. And um, it was so, the, the restaurant was so old fashioned that if you said you wanted scotch, they literally brought a bottle of scotch to your table. <laughs> and it was like an honor system. You know, you would just tell them at the end of the meal, I had three shots. How, how much you drink? <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't a bar. It was a restaurant. It was fancy white tablecloths and bouquet. But I remember sitting at the table and my friend said, look over there in the corner. And I, yeah, turned around, hopefully politely and stared and said, yeah. He goes, that's James Mishner. <laughs> really? Yeah, he, uh, yeah, he was there, and you know, because he was, he moved. I don't know if he lives permanently, or I'm sure he's passed away now. I don't know. Um, he he lived in the area while he was writing yeah. that book. But, I, I, yeah, I, I think that's his. That's why he's so good because he goes and lives 
for a while in the area to really understand. That's why yeah. he is so uh, amazing, uh, you know, at, at his work. I, I, I read a lot of his books. They're huge. Uh, many people are intimidated. But um, I, I... No, they're uh, very readable. Like them. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, very yeah of, course, of course they are, but because they are like thousands. Yeah, pages. because they're thick. Yeah, they, yeah, people right. are like, well, yeah, no, Hawaii is fantastic. Right, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah a lot of it. I, I read um, uh, most of them that has to do uh, relevance to the places. Uh, you know, I think, yeah, Hawaii is great. Uh, the Source, that's a, a, yeah. that's a very interesting book. No, yeah. Um, yeah, by, yeah, by no. A non Jew. Uh, which yeah. Is, but yeah, he, he but he always uh, right. He also Poland. He wrote book Poland. They're very good. Um, and uh, about South Africa, the Covenant, um, fantastic book. Uh, uh, I think yeah, Hawaii was actually my first book that I read by him. Yeah. 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 No, he's uh, he's made and you know having.